have her with us in Columbia. Um, and our second speaker, and she'll be speaking on the dynamic roles of a Muslim um, and the Muslim student, the changing face of student activism. So even if some of us are not currently students, um, inshallah, um, her topic can be related to everybody and what they're going through. Um, and our second speaker is Dr. Jonathan Brown, and he's currently the Assistant Professor of Islam and Muslim Christian Relations in Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Um, he received a Bachelor in History from Georgetown, Georgetown University in 2000 and his Doctor in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations from the University of Chicago in 2006. Additionally, he studied and conducted research in many countries, such as Egypt, Syria, Turkey, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, South Africa, India, and Indonesia, and Iran. And we're also very fortunate to have him with us here in Colombia. And he'll be speaking on the continuity and change in Islamic law. So after each of the speakers gives um, their, their short talk, we'll have questions opened up to everybody. and. So just keep those in mind, um, and if you don't have a question after the first talk, we'll save time for questions after the second one as well. So I'm going to go ahead and invite uh, Stella Bahra Ahmed up here to give the first talk. So as some of you are enjoying your mid-evening or snack or whatever you're crunching on. <laughs> this is getting quite informal, which is totally cool with me. Um, just out, you know, out of respect for some other people, though. Um, if we could, um, yeah, probably stop the crunching. That would be great. Thank you. I, appreci I would appreciate it. Except for the little one, I guess. It's all good. <laughs> So I'm actually, uh, I've written my thoughts out because um, I have a tendency when I speak separatingly to go off and in, you know, the presence of our uh, great, well, he doesn't want to be called Sheikh, but uh, Dr. Brown's here and I think uh, definitely we would want to give him uh, ample time to address you all um, and I'm actually here more so to hear him speak than my own self. So um, I've written my thoughts down and so if anyone um, is at any point confused about what I said, just hold off uh, during question and answer session, and inshallah, I'll be able to address that. So I wanted to th uh, start off by thanking uh, the many gracious departments that helped sponsor this conference, particularly the MSA here at Mizzou, along with the amazing leadership of Taha, Yusuf, Arwa, and others alike. I am truly honored to be able to join you, especially in the presence of Dr. Brown, who I am sure you heard earlier, and I am sure that you concur that he is a terrific scholar. We at Northwestern were able to host him last year and truly enjoyed his company. In fact, if he permits, we have a running joke on campus that Dr. Brown is by far one of the most smartest Muslim scholars in North America. And by smart, of course, uh, I don't, I mean the typical Asian auntie smart. Um, which, you know, would refers to uh, a handsome young, young lad, so to speak. Um, he's not offended, I'm sure. Um, but on a more serious note, he's truly a terrific addition to the growing number of Muslim scholars in the academy, and I urge you to grasp as much as you can while he is here and to engage him with your questions and reflections. With that said, I will keep, again, my part of this panel short and allow for uh, our scholar to address you with ample time. Now, my talk today about the changing role of Muslim student activism is from the perspective of my career as a university chaplain who interacts on a daily basis with student groups in the Division of Student Affairs at Northwestern University and colleges across the United States. Some of you may be questioning, what in the world is a Muslim chaplain? Without transgressing too much, I think it's important to share with you that Islamic chaplaincy is a small but growing field of nearly 46 Muslim chaplains serving at various academic institutions across North America. For many of us, our services are not limited to Muslim students, but to the larger campus community, which enables us to build strong connections with many diverse groups on campus. My role on campus is to provide spiritual and mental health counseling for the overall campus community, including faculty and staff, students, and the 30 various religious groups on campus. We facilitate interfaith dialogue, represent the Muslim community on behalf of the Office of Religious Life, and foster sustained relations among the various faith communities on campus. As a Muslim chaplain, I get to be on the forefront of campus-wide programming and help shape the ways in which students across a broad spectrum of race and religion interact. So I can offer some insight as to developing proactive student engagement. 
but certainly I will acknowledge that every campus is unique and presents its own challenges. While Mizzou may share the plight of other MSAs, clearly your challenges are unique and require individualized feasibility and assessment surveys, which I will refer to later. In essence, my talk may only address a basic framework for the challenges you face, but my hope is that it will bring some insight for your own reflection on priorities for your particular MSA. I want to start by congratulating the MSA on your honorable mention for the Chancellor's Excellence Awards for the most outstanding large organization, mashallah, for raising substantial funding for the Horn of Africa famine, and for doubling your membership in the span of one academic year. Clearly, I am speaking to an MSA who, by definition, is already on the move and active. Like we say on the basketball court, you, got, you all got your game on, right? Most of you know I was a basketball player. I played through uh, high school and with varsity basketball and was recruited to play at DePaul of Blue Demons. I know I'm only 5'6", but you know, um, quick guards don't really need to be that tall. Um, but you know, I gave, I didn't take that opportunity and went on to Madrasa to spend time learning Sarf and Neho and eating lots of dal and chamal, which you know, kind of lost my hops there. But I think I still got my game on. <laughs> Actually, I know this is kind of tangential, but at our masjid, our local masjid, we actually have a girls' <coughs> night basketball, and one of my Northwestern students actually walked in, the brothers take the gym after, he walked in a few minutes early and he was like, Sister Tahira, is that you? And he was like, man, you're like 80% better than most of the brothers. And he's like, can you shoot with us? And I was like, nah. But when he said 80%, that's a Northwestern student, by the way. Somehow he like calculated all of the shots and was like 80%. Um, I stuck around and he had to change that 80%. You know, to, to obviously a higher percentage. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so it, you all got your game on here, right? You are creating a dynamic community of Muslims who serve the needs of your campus. So congratulations to you. Now I want to share an anecdotal experience with you. Several weeks ago, I was invited by an MSA whose identity I will not reveal per respect. I was asked to speak at an event on the topic of perfecting our character. I looked at my calendar and said, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm booked that day. Then within seconds I said, wait, what do you know? I'm actually going to be on your campus on the very day at the same time for another event. It's for Yom Hashua, you know, Holocaust Remembrance Day. I paused and said to the student, we can totally make this work on the same day, but the timing will need to change. I'm willing to come out earlier or stay later, but let's have your MSA join me there for solidarity. The student was silent and proceeded to tell me that the MSA is quite aware of the fact that they are hosting an event at the same time as the Holocaust Remembrance Day and were not willing to change their event timing because of logistical issues and that they did not, quote, see how it would fall under the priorities of their MSA and, quote, bring benefits to the MSA. I requested the student to talk to the exec board and get back to me. Unfortunately, the answer remained unaltered. As an advisor and chaplain, my first response was to offer all of the great reasons why this event would serve to benefit their MSA. I argued that almost all the major groups on campus were partaking in the event, even from, from secular humanists to the conservative Catholics on campus. They're all going to be present. My hope, through seemingly convincing arguments, failed to no avail. So on, on, excuse me, on April 18th, after the Yohesha event, I joined the MSA during their question and answer session in the audience and asked the speaker, how can we, as Muslims, begin to address the topic of perfecting our character when we cannot recognize the need to stand in solidarity with those who suffered an injustice? How can we, as Muslims, expect good onto us when we fail to let our peer groups know that we will stand by them because we come from a tradition of esteemed moral character? These rhetorical questions were not ill motives as mocking adva advancements, but rather to initiate conversations with the MSA about how the impact of our decisions has wide ramifications on our relationships with groups, uh, groups across the college campus arena. After the event, the students and I began a dialogue about the big why, as to resisting a change in the timing of their event was even an issue. Interestingly, the first response was from a bright student who remarked that their inability to change the timing should not be labeled as anti-Semitic. He said, our MSA just needs its own time and space to grow. The Catholics, they are a strong group on this campus and they don't 
have it hard like we Muslims do. We don't even have people who come regularly. We just need our we just need to build our own community. I reminded the students that Catholics don't necessarily have it any easier. In fact, historically, Catholics have preserved persevered, excuse me, through challenges of social rejection both in and out of the college arena. Even now, during college, many young Catholics face the struggle of defining their religious identity. Recent surveys conducted by both UCLA and Georgetown reveal that Catholic students who exclusively participated or attended Catholic-only settings were more likely to be challenged of their religious identity during college. Even more so, actually, even more so than those who attended secular institutions. CARA, or the Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate at Georgetown, in their 2010 research titled Catholicism on Campus, Stability and Change in Catholic Student Faith by College Type, surveyed some 38 colleges and found that students who were more active beyond their own faith setting were more likely to develop a stronger faith identity. The notion of developing a stronger self-identity through interaction with the other is depicted in another stu study known to the Division of Student Affairs as the Harry Study, led by the Higher Education Research Institute at UCLA. The survey titled College Student Beliefs and Values surveyed nearly 14,000 students, 14,527 to be exact, at 148 U.S. colleges and universities and found that by junior year, majority of these students expressed, number one, interest in religion or spirituality, number two, that they felt most inspired toward their faith through working with people from various backgrounds. Our own 2011 study at Northwestern surveyed some 2,000 students, along with 54 specialized case studies of students who revealed that their spiritual experience was most enhanced when they interacted with people of another faith. So in essence, these surveys confirm the reality of young adults and their desire for spiritual experiences, as well as document where these experiences are more likely to occur. It's not all happening. Sorry. There we go. Um, it's not all happening in the hermitage of the individual prayer spaces or services, but rather through learning about the world around us and growing a deeper appreciation of one's own faith. The argument, then, of identity loss due to assimilation is merely a fear. One may consider it a, an, an unnecessary risk, but aren't we as Muslims required to look for the greater benefit in all things? This concept seems pretty simple, but it's a concept known in Sharia as fiqh al-mawazanat in Sharia, or the art of weighing the macro benefit. I'm sure Dr. Brown can elaborate on this during his talk. This has been researched by traditional Muslim scholars, including Imam Al-Izzuddin, Abdul Salam, Imam Al-Ghazali, Imam Juwaini, Ibn Taymiyyah, Rahimahullah, um, and the list goes on. And quote, Ibn Qayyim, Rahimahullah, in his I'lam al waqiin states, the Sharia has been revealed to obtain all possible benefits and to reduce all harm as much as possible. The concept of, you know, Jalb al-Masalih wa Darb al-Mafasid. Number one, to bring benefit to humanity, and number two, prevent harm as, as much as possible. Clearly, the concept of an MSA that fosters sustained relationships with others is not only beneficial for their own development and identity, but also brings greater benefit to humanity. However, sometimes activism with other groups presents challenges that are rather complex, and I recognize that. Questions about working with pro-Israeli groups pro-choice for abortion rights, or with the LGBT community may require a greater level of commitment on behalf of the MSA to understand the issues presented and come to a viable decision that is most beneficial. It may require an open forum for dialogue and understanding where we differ. But essentially, the conversations must start. The nature and framework of the dialogue will present its own challenges, and I acknowledge that. But we must, and we may fail one year, but we will learn the next. Working with other groups should not deter us from building our own community. In fact, there is much to learn from the years of experiences from groups such as Hillel and Inner Varsity, who have a lot to offer when it comes to religious programming and organizing on a college campus. With that said, I want to clarify that I am not advocating for MSAs to work with every group and every cause. But rather, I am calling for discourse on weighing the options, understanding the key issues, and clearly objectifying what it means to endorse an event, and whether or not it will bring greater benefit or harm in a conversation, and this is a conversation that we cannot afford to surpass. 
We are reminded that at the peak of Prophet Muhammad um, hardship with the Meccan community, the Prophet pointed towards Mecca and told his companions that if these people who were polytheists were ready to work with him on good, then he, then he would be ready. These people were polytheists, and even the Quran tells us not to insult them. In Surah Ma'idah, we are reminded, And do not insult those uh, that invoke other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Student activists have the responsibility of being proactive, which means that before we come to conclusions, we need to understand and assess issues and weigh in all of the options and understand the greater benefit. However, in doing so, we must create a space for people to express their difference of opinion. Even those students who chose not to change the time of the event as the same day as the Holocaust Remembrance Day, or those who refrain from working with the LGBT community or pro-choice groups on environmental issues, everyone has a right to their perspective. But we cannot ignore the significance of creating a space for respectful dialogue, especially for the big why as to when we disagree and why we disagree. We, when we simply don't want to work with each other, we send the message that we as Muslims have an inherent problem with the people rather than what are perhaps some warranted reasons for our disengagement. Finally, I want to conclude on the concept that our activism must bring us greater benefit in our own individual and spiritual lives. If MSA is not helping us become better human beings and closer to our divine creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we must question what is it that we seek for inspiration in this work? It's great to partake in large MSA events surrounded by people who encourage you. However, every activist needs a recharger or a boost of energy from spaces that may not, that may be less congregational, so to speak. When the Prophet asked his companions to pray their sunnah prayers at home, essentially, he was detaching them from the congregational setting and allowing them an opportunity for self-reflection and growth. The fine balance of working with other people which promotes self-identity and yet seeking inspiration through individual reflection and tranquility <coughs> will surely allow us and lead us to mastery of productive student activism. Thank you. <laughs>